you know, one of the questions was why do brains sleep and dream? Sleep is still a little complicated, but you know, there are a bunch of hypotheses. But I think that my student and I solved why we dream at night. And I can tell you if you're interested in that. <laughs> of course. Yeah. No, thanks. Okay. Yeah, we're in a rush here. Yeah, please, please go ahead, David. It has to do with brain plasticity. So the brain is always reconfiguring itself. It's a very dynamic system. And, you know, every one of these neurons in your head, they look like, you know, branching trees and they make 10,000 connections to other neurons. But these are constantly moving. So imagine like moving trees that are plugging and unplugging and seeking and connecting with others and so on. So anyway, that's called brain plasticity, this constant reconfiguration. And it turns out the surprise in neuroscience is how rapidly things can start moving and changing. And so some colleagues of mine at Harvard back in, I think, 2007, did this experiment where they put people in, in fMRI, the brain scanner, and they blindfolded them tightly. And they were doing things like, you know, when you're exposed to sound or touch, what is that? you know, what's happening in the brain. And what they found is that in 60 minutes, the visual system started responding to touch and to sound. And that was really unexpected because we know that if you go blind, your visual system will get taken over, especially if you're really young. But no one would have ever dreamt that you'd start seeing the first signs of takeover in 60 minutes. And so that got my student and I to start thinking about something right away. And we realized that dreaming has to do with the rotation of the planet. And this is because, you know, the planet rotates into darkness. So we spend half our time in the dark. Obviously, I'm not talking about electricity blessed times, but historical evolutionary times. What this means is you can still hear and smell and taste and touch in the dark, but you can't see in the dark. And that puts the visual system at a disadvantage. It's like you have been blindfolded in a sense. And so what we realized is the visual system has to fight back to, to keep its territory all during the night. And so that's what dreaming is about. Every 90 minutes, you've got these very specialized circuits that blast activity just into the visual cortex. That's all that happens in dreaming is it's going just to primary visual cortex, all this random activity. And it's just to keep it defended against takeover from its neighbors. To prevent the weeds of other senses from encroaching on the walled garden of vision. Exactly. You got it. You got it. It's a screensaver. <laughs> What's very interesting is a lot of people have asked me when I present this, I'm, I'm presenting this at a big talk at Stanford tomorrow, by the way. And you know, a lot of people say like, wait, don't we already know why we dream? And the answer is no, we don't know why we dream. There are various hypotheses, but that doesn't mean you stop making hypotheses. And the reason this one matters, I think, is because it is the first ever one that makes quantitative predictions across species. So what we did is we found 25 different species of primates, and we looked at how plastic their brains are. Some primates come out very plastic, like Homo sapiens. Others, like the gray mouse lemur, it's called, is you know very not plastic. It drops out. It reaches puberty rapidly. It knows how to walk rapidly. It, it's, just, it's, it's sort of pre-programmed, if you want to think about it that way. What are you using as a proxy or a measurement for plasticity? It's time to wean from their mothers, time to walking, time to puberty, things like this. I got it. So how much is kind of out of the box versus how much is molding of the Play-Doh? You got it. That's exactly it. And got so it. Homo sapiens, it's unbelievable. I mean, we're so useless for so long. And that's because we've got these <laughs> extraordinary plastic brains. We drop into the world half-baked and we absorb the world around us. We absorb the language and the culture and all the knowledge that has come before us. And that's why it takes us so long to develop. But, you know, these some some of the other monkeys and apes or whatever, they drop out, they're good to go. And if you look at something like an alligator, you know, it's just like eat, run, mate. That's all it's doing. There's no, there's nothing other than the pre-programming that it needs. Okay. So anyway, it turns out if you look at the amount of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, rapid eye movement sleep is what correlates with dreaming. If you look at the amount of REM sleep that these different animals get, you find that it correlates perfectly like a perfect machine gun brrr, correlation. So more REM, more plasticity. Exactly. By the way, if you're a baby human, you dream all the time. They have about 50% of their sleep is REM sleep, is dream sleep. And as you get older, your brain is less plastic. And by the way, you have less percentage of REM sleep. But anyway, for a an animal that's not particularly plastic, it has very little dream sleep. Are you aware of any 
counter examples? Are there any species that seem to exhibit a decent percentage of REM sleep, but that one would not conclude are particularly high plasticity outside of primates? No, no. I don't know any counterexamples where they have a lot of REM sleep, but I did come across one which I thought was a real problem for the hypothesis, which is elephants. Elephants have almost no REM sleep. They do have a little bit of REM once in a while, but otherwise they don't. And of course, you know, elephants have big brains and so on. But it turns out elephants only sleep one to two hours a night and they have excellent night vision. So they don't need to keep their visual cortex mm. protected against takeover in the same way that, that we do. So that actually falls right into line in the theory. That's fascinating. 